Thank you for joining Treeline Review's resupply and nutrition session. Um, we have three really great through hikers who are here to talk about their experiences on trail around food and resupply. Um, as we start and as people are joining us, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on Treeline Review. We are a gear review website that was founded by two through hikers, myself and Naomi, who will be running the Q&A. Um, we were on trail and we were talking about how we found other gear review websites to be lacking in, on several fronts. And our mission is to help people buy right the first time. And as a result, that's one of the things that you'll notice when you're going through Treeline Review gear reviews is that our goal is to help you buy less stuff. And part of that is rooted in our experiences as through hikers. We love nature, we love the planet, and this inspires us to help more people get outdoors and for them to need fewer things to do the things that they love outdoors. Our goal is also to create welcoming and inclusive gear reviews. We want everyone to feel comfortable and empowered in the outdoors. And that's why we have articles on things like choosing gear to how to get into outdoor activities, new outdoor activities like through hiking, um, where to go. You'll find lots of different trip guides um, for different trail, national scenic trails, shorter trails, um, national parks. Um, and that's also why we hold panels like what we're doing today to help demystify and remove some of the gatekeeping from outdoor activities. So that's a little bit about Treeline Review. And if you haven't had a chance, we encourage you to check out the website. Um, and without further ado, I'll hop into the goals of this panel. So the goals of this resupply and nutrition panel is to have people of all types of nutritional needs and physical abilities feel inspired about the options that are available to them on a backpacking trip or on a through hike and to leave new hikers feeling confident that they can resupply and feed themselves on trail. Um, the other goals of this panel are that healthy nutrition really matters and how you get food that your body needs can really vary from trail to trail and from hiker to hiker. And so that's why we have three hikers who have very different ways of going about their resupply, sharing their stories. Um, we also want to recognize that everyone has a little bit different of a resupply style. Um, and the reason that they do it is related to their goals. So each of these hikers will talk about the things that are important to them. Um, and you can see how that informs the food that they choose and also how they get that food to themselves. And we also want to say that no matter what your resupply style is, um, try it home, try it on an overnight backpacking trip, um, try it on a shorter trail if you can, because you're going to learn a lot just going through that process of being in the field. Um, and you're going to find out what works for you. And ultimately, the best solution is the one that works for you. So thank you so much for joining this panel. Our three panelists are Aaron Owens May Mayhew, um, Trey French, um, Trey Tamari French, um, and Theo Bliss Davis. So Aaron, do you want to go first? My name is Aaron, and I'm known as Backcountry Foodie. My trail name is actually Sling, but I've been Backcountry Foodie since 2017. And I'm a registered dietitian at Through Hiker, and I have backcountryfoodie.com, which is all about what we're talking about today, all about learning how to fuel yourself, what kinds of foods, how often to eat. Um, all about meal planning. And I also have a resupply service, which is what all these boxes are behind me, is actually I do resupplies for through hikers. So I do a lot of things. Hi, my name is Trey French. Um, I live in Bishop, California, which is a Pacific Crest Trail trail town. Um, I hiked a few uh, long trails, the Pacific Crest Trail, the Continental Divide Trail, the Long Trail in Vermont, and then some other shorter single food resupply um, trips in Utah, Colorado, and generally across the West and a little bit in the Northeast as well. Well, my name's Bliss. Um, I started as a couch potato person and um, I did 5Ks and every summer I just gradually built myself up to doing longer and longer hikes, uh, starting with the Wonderland Trails and the Pacific Northwest Volcano Hikes, then the Tahoe Rim Trail, the JMT, and then eventually the Pacific Crest Trail. And then since then, uh, and that was in 2017. And then I've done uh, hiking in the Alps and Europe and got into bike packing and ski touring. So, um, but yeah, this, this resupply, this is probably the most challenging thing and it's also the most costly thing. So it still makes me nervous today, but you being here is you're ahead of your other fellow hikers, uh, just being here. And so I'm excited to share some knowledge with you today. Thank you, Theo. 
-hmm. Now, I would like all the panelists to talk a little bit about their hiking style and their eating style while they're on trail and how those are related. So my hiking style is very much related to what the trip is because every trail is different. The weather's different, the climate, you know, the terrain is different. So it really depends on that. Um, I know Stobolus is really hot right now. So some trips I've done Stobolus, sometimes I really want a hot meal. So that's kind of what depends. I'm very particular about what I eat. <laughs> so I'm kind of probably the outlier of the group is I make all my own food. I have since 2016. Um, and that's because again, I'm a dietitian. I've been an athlete my entire life. So I'm very particular about how much nutrition I get because I know it directly affects how I feel when I'm hiking. Um, I've made those mistakes. I've hit the wall more times than I can count and it's horrible. So now I've learned how to feed myself so that doesn't happen anymore. Um, and again, every trail is different. So I pack differently for every trail and I'd be happy to kind of talk about that later on too. Uh, so my eating choices is heavily informed by my dietary restriction, which is gluten. I have celiac disease. So it's sort of like, for those who don't know, it's sort of like an allergy, but technically it's an autoimmune disorder. Um, so in addition to avoiding gluten, I also have to avoid, um, cross-contamination, which is the crux for, um, managing it on a through hike because, um, as you know, or may find out when you embark on one, um, you think about food a lot and not just on trail, but, uh, but also in towns, um, where I think, um, the biggest challenge can be, uh, for someone with celiac disease. Um, but it informs, um, uh, my eating choices, uh, in a way that it tends to be a little bit more expensive than others, uh, just for processed foods. I typically need to spend a little bit more, um, as far as hiking style, I like to hike all day. I like to do long days. I often like to hike alone. Um, and what this means is I also like to eat a lot of convenient foods um, that I can uh, consume while walking. Me, my hiking style, I like to wake up early. Uh, dawn and dusk are my favorite times to hike. Something about the light, the angle of the light and the birds are chirping and all that stuff. I feel fresh. I got that second wind during those times. When I was on the PCT, it was around, I did about 20 to 30 miles. And uh, since then, uh, I've been hiking more like 20 miles, but I love stopping at every uh, viewpoint when uh, after lunch, I like to jump in a lake and um, I just, uh, I love walking with other folks. Um, it's um, with my nutrition style, I, I, I do a first breakfast when I wake up, then um, I like to do a second breakfast, um, kind of mid-morning and then I have my first snack and then I have my lunch and then I got a then I try and take some sort of afternoon tea break coffee break um and then I and then I usually get the second win and it gets me to dinner which is around dusk and then I'm I'm fast asleep in my tent I guess just to describe my my uh, nutrition a little better for you. It's, um, this is kind of how I describe it. It's a happy, hot, healing, hyper kind of uh, diet that I use. So happy, it's for my, what's important to me is it's for my mental health. Like I really need to, um, it makes me happy when I'm eating. If I have the wrong food, then, then, uh, you know, it's like a downward spiral. The healing, I, I, I get cramps. I, so I need salt in my diet. Um, the hot, I love my food hot. It just, it's just morale boosting. Um, there's something about that. I can't go stoveless and the hyper that just means I'm, uh, it, it has, it's very adaptable. It's changing all the time. What I'm eating at the beginning of the hike is totally different than what I'm eating, uh, midway through my through hike or even at the end and every year it changes. So you really have to be in tune with your body. It's just, it's, so that's the hyper. And so, yeah, I asked you, what's, what's your coat of arms here for yourself? Now, I think all of you did a really great job of briefly talking about the sort of foods that you like to eat on trail. And food is obviously a very big part about resupply. My question for you is what other things do you include in your resupply? Whether you're like Aaron and Trey and send boxes to yourself or Theo buying more locally along the way. Are there medications, special size shoes, hard to find gear items that are also part of your resupply that are things that you need to replenish along the way when you're on a long trip hike? So again, being the dietitian, I think about food all the time and vitamins and minerals. So I actually take a multivitamin because it alleviates kind of the extra pressure of trying to eat really healthy along the way. Um, 
and I don't know if many people know this, but the process of dehydrating food actually eliminates a lot of the vitamins. So just because the processing, you even though you try to eat as healthy as possible, you can't get in all the vitamins. So that's one thing I always carry with me is multivitamins and vitamin I, like everybody else does, <laughs> kind of always goes along with me too. Um, and a lot of the other things I tend to pick up in town because I never know when I'm going to run through TP, you know, all those kind of things I can plan out as well in advance as I need to, but then you use up something quicker than other things last a lot longer. So then you have like this extra supply of hand wipes, you know, all those kind of things. So those I tend to pick up along the way rather than sending those in the boxes. So my boxes are really just food. So to make one thing clear, uh, one, I send, I'm, um, uh, definitely on the margins here, I send 100% boxes. Um, the only exception is if I'm uh, confident there is a large grocery store that I can make do. And even then, I typically will send myself something. I'll just send myself less so they have the opportunity to buy fresh foods in town. Um, but a huge benefit of doing it this way is that if I'm going to send spend all this time planning and loading these food boxes, um, I might as well send myself um, a bunch of other non food stuff that, so I can just sort of take care of all my town needs at once, uh, with my resupply box. So I'm not sort of, um, spending energy, um, hunting stuff down in town, um, that I could be spending either in a uh, bed resting, um, at a campground or getting back out on the trail, just depending on, you know, what your goals might be. Um, so I'm just going to share a short list of things that I also send myself that might be things that you haven't thought of. Um, I usually send myself shoes. I have a pretty big foot um, and I'm very particular about my footwear and uh, I have found that small changes make big differences over the course of a long day. Um, so I typically will send shoes every four to 500 miles. Um, just standard over-the-counter medicines for allergies, um, vitamin I, as uh, Aaron mentioned. <laughs> um, I used Aquamira, which is um, a water uh, treatment uh, chemical. Um, but the the downside of carrying that is that you can run out. So I send myself repackaged smaller bo bottles, which are also light, lighter weight, um, every few resupplies. Um, typically every se seven to 10 days, I can get out of my bottles. Um, I'll send pre-portioned toilet paper, um, uh, new food bags as, as I expect to need them. Um, I bring a small bottle of soap um, for backcountry bidet, if anybody's familiar with that. Uh, mm -hmm contact solution, because I wear contacts, um, hand sanitizer repackaged, um, repackaged bug repellent when necessary. Um, if you've ever, if you're going to do the PCT, um, there's definitely a peak bug season on that trail, mm -hmm. um, depending on where you are um, in roughly June. Um, I send myself mini toothpaste, and uh, I will usually send myself one compactor bag, compactor bag pack liner pro, um, before I develop any holes. Well, I think foodie and French covered everything I bring, but here's a couple more. So one thing when you do resupply that's really important is that you have an off-trail champion, someone who is reliable, reliable, <laughs> reliable. <laughs> <laughs> not, not your, not your, you don't need your stoner friend. You got to have someone who's really reliable, who can send you those those layers of clothing you need for the when it gets too hot, when it gets too cold, uh, when when you get to the Sierras, you're going to need that bear can, you're going to need that ice axe, and you need that stuff to show up on time, like like the second you call them and tell them you need it or that date you gave them, it needs to be there. You can't wait another day or two waiting for that. That's the most nerve wracking stuff. Um, of course, when you're getting close to Canada, or if you're international hiking, uh, you might have to send a passport. So uh, that's important. And I like it when uh, when uh, there's extra cash in there. That's that's like a nice <laughs> fun thing to have. Um, desperation ads, and this this is sometimes you need shoes on the trail. Some and um, here's a here's a good tip. Uh, go to REI before your through hike and. Try out a bunch of different shoes, kind of note your uh, shoe size so that when it's time for you to place that order online, you can just, you you know right away. And um, you'll probably notice your your uh, your feet swell up too. But I've had, the, the, it's amazing. They just send um, resupply to so many places, so many remote places. So, um, so like shoes. Uh, the best ad, the best ad ever is um, a handwritten letter or some sort of 
if you have a niece or nephew, if they if they throw in the some little kids drawing, it just it's 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 like you just gained a hundred miles like of credit. So those are uh those are my resupply tips. That's a great addition, Theo. My pub trivia team all signed a, a card for me that they sent in my reef supply along with my shoes, and it was just like, oh. I'd like you to talk about what led you in the direction of the way that you resupply um, and also some pros and cons of your resupply style, because we all know that some that every resupply style has has some some good things about it and some things that are drawbacks. This goes back to kind of what I said when I was doing my intros that I make all my food and I have since 2016. And that's because I'm very aware about how I feel when I hike um, based on my nutrition. So I like to have complete control over it. Um, and I like my food. I haven't eaten a commercial meal in a very long time because I just don't like the taste of it. Um, so that's why I make all my own food. Um, the pro is that because I do have control, I know I'm going to like my food. The con is that I am a cereal long um, section hiker. I have every intention of doing the full through hike, but I get hurt. I get sick. It's inevitable. Something always happens. And then I have 30 days, 60 days, five months worth of food left over that I wasn't able to eat. Um, so that's definitely the con is that if you make all this ahead of time, then you have a lot of leftovers. Um, so one of the things I try to do is now I have a freezer. So I throw everything in the freezer so I can use it for another trip or I donate it to other hikers. Um, there's even been a time when I did the Colorado Trail, I got really, really sick and couldn't eat anything. Is that we actually went to a grocery store and I made 30 more days worth of meal replacement shakes and I lived off of those. Um, and that worked really well. I was able to not hit the wall and stay hydrated and that kind of thing. Um, so that's definitely the con and part of me sending my own boxes, it does get expensive because you are paying for that shipping, um, and those kind of things. But pro tip is use a region, what used to be called a regional rate box is just use a priority mailing box instead of the flat rate, um, showing a show and tell here, um, as this is a huge box that you could ship for $12 instead of $27. This is a 10 pounds worth of food. Um, so if you are going to be shipping along the way, or you live near the trail, then I would definitely use just the priority mailing box instead of the flat rates. Cause it's a lot cheaper. Um, and then I'm actually really lucky that I have a husband that is that reliable person <laughs> that I can call. And so, and that's the other tip is that I don't seal all the boxes before I leave. So everything is loose. So he can pick and choose. I'm like, I'm really sick and tired of X. So then he'll pull that out, put something else in for me. Um, and I've even gotten to where I just like, just throw some food in the box because that way it's a surprise when I get it. Um, because I used to be super organized and would have menu number one, menu number two, menu number three, you know, and I had it all out, but then I knew what was coming. I was like, oh gosh, I hate menu number three. Like that's just terrible. Um, so I've gotten to where I let him have a lot of freedom and he throws things in the box. Um, and like you were talking about having like the fun thing is that having friends mail you cookies <laughs> is such a treat. <laughs> it's something homemade. If you have a mom or grandma or whoever can throw something in your box, it's homemade. It really makes a big difference too. So um, there's definitely pros and definitely cons about resupply strategies. Fortunately, there are some pretty big cons, um, especially if you are not confident that you're going to be able to eat consistently the food that you send yourself. Um, I found that fortunately I'm able to eat the same thing every day. Um, similar to what Aaron said, uh, I pretty particular when well, the time of the day that I eat um, the food and what's in there um, because I know in advance how I can expect for it to make me feel. Um, I like sugar, sugar heavy stuff part of the day. I like uh, carbs and fats the other part of the day. Um, and so just being able to be it being predictable and uh, any, any, any chance I have to put order in my hike, um, I do it because there are so many things like Aaron said that can't happen. <laughs> um, and when things do happen, yeah, you could be left with extra food. Um, I've been fortunate to be uh, not left with uh, I've not had any major events happen on trail uh, to take me off um, and had a lot extra, but I do consistently um, have maybe a thousand calories at the end of every resupply that I need to find a home for. Uh, usually these are hiker boxes. Um, and if I have a lot, I have even mailed food home because the value of the food was higher than um, the cost of shipping. Um, but really drives me uh, to be so particular or precise with packing is because with celiac, I know that I can't depend on uh, places that don't have big grocery stores um, because I know that I'll be left with eating just chips and 
nuts <laughs> pretty much um, is pretty much the only thing that I can eat out of like a gas station, um, for example. Um, but yeah, I'd say the only other media pro that I can think of is that it's just very fast. Um, if you want to get in town and leave um, for whatever reason, um, you just simply pick up a box and you're gone. Um, one other major con is that though I do love the postal service. Um, they are not immune to making mistakes. Um, so you do need to keep track of that tracking. Um, I've had a package uh, go to Hawaii once. Uh, fortunately, I was able to get it redirected mm -hmm. after it was already in Hawaii and arrive uh, before I got to town. Um, but that can happen and it can add an extra stress if you don't have that sort of um, point person, that old reliable person at home doing that for you. And Trey, just to follow up with your boxes, uh, mm -hmm. are you sending them all general delivery to post offices along the trail? Are you sending them sometimes to hostels? What's sort of your strategy around mailing boxes to make sure they get there and that you're able to get them when the place is open? Sure. So any chance I get to send it to somewhere other than a post office, I do it. Um, this is mostly because they have limited hours. Um, and, you know, a lot of them are closed on Sundays um, in these small towns uh, they may be closed even more frequently and their hours sometimes are very odd between nine and 12 <laughs> in these really uh, very rural places. Um, if I can help it, I'll send it to a hostel, even if I'm not staying there. Um, typically, they'll hold them for you for a small fee, um, five to ten dollars uh, since the last time I threw hiked, which has been a couple of years. Um, I'll also send things UPS to a hotel if I expect to stay there. Um, but yeah, if I can, if I have to, I'll send it general delivery. Um, and if I'm concerned about a post office holding it long enough, I will give them a call and say, hey, I just want to make sure you're not going to dump my package back, um, you know, return to sender style because uh, that would not, not be fun. Um, but I'd say number one tip is if you can send it anywhere but the post office, do it because they're more likely to be accessible when you get to town than the post office is. If you do need to reroute it and bounce your box, you could have a lot of trouble actually getting a hold of somebody to bounce it. Um, so that's just something to kind of think about too. Erin, can you explain what you mean by bouncing boxes for those who are unfamiliar mm -hmm. with that service? Yes. Postal service? So bouncing boxes is essentially like bouncing the box forward or backward. <laughs> um, it's if you're, okay, so if you're not necessarily gonna get to the spot where you've sent your box, you can give them a call and say, I'm, I'm a hiker, you have my box there, I'm not gonna make it, can you please send it to the next post office and you give them that information. Um, some post offices will do that over the phone. Others want you to be there in person. So you do have to show up with your ID. So that's kind of a drawback about that too is some, the more friendly hiker towns are usually better about bouncing when you call over the phone. Others are not as nice about it. Um, so if you do get to the post office and you don't necessarily need what's in that box, you can bounce it forward to your next stop as long as you don't open it. Um, as soon as you take it out of their holding and you open it up, then you're gonna have to pay shipping again. Um, so that's kind of what bouncing a box. Some people, they fill up a box with some extra supplies that they just kind of using along the way. So that's one of the reasons for bouncing too. Thank you. Thank you for that, Aaron. And it sounds like one of the things to know about the post office is that although there might be a nationwide rule that each post office kind of goes by their own rules. Hmm. Yes, some are definitely nicer than others. <laughs> For sure. Uh, yeah, one one tip I have for sending one of those bounce boxes that has a bunch of supplies that sometimes I might open and sometimes I don't is I write on the outside what's on the inside of the box so I don't have to open it and be like, oh, I didn't need any of this stuff. Right. If you're if you have a bounce box and you think you're just going to send it to the next post office down the highway and you think it's just going to show up the next day, it won't because uh, it will go to the regional distribution center first and that could and that could be the line between those two towns and um and then it takes like a couple of days and that that happened to me uh between like lone pine and bishop and boy i couldn't believe it i was like it's right down the road and didn't show up yeah anyway uh hey my uh so what led me in the direction of my uh my style, which is kind of resupply from the trail. Um, so I started, I started, um, I, I looked on the, I looked online and I found some plan and I was trying to be healthy. 
And uh, so I followed it. I went to the health food store. I bought like forty dollars in nuts and raw nuts. And uh, and I get out to the trail to the desert, and I uh, all, and I'm trying to eat these raw nuts with some healthy dip. And uh, it wasn't me. And it was hot, and I was around all these other hikers, and they were loving their food, and I I couldn't take another bite of my food, and I was like, what am I doing here? And and you got to eat, you need you need the calories, you need the energy to do it. So um so I I I, I yeah, if you're not you you got to fuel yourself and and not um I don't know, you got to find your way, you know. I mean like like. Trey's, Trey's plan is different from mine, but it all works. Uh, you know, you got to find who you are. The other thing that led me this way too was when I was, uh, you know, I, I, I counted all my ounces. I, I got my base weight down, but then I'd come into town with like three pounds of food. And I was like, what? what? Like, like, you know, I was trying to follow like this two pounds per, you know, uh, day rule, but yeah, I was like, like I'm wasting all this weight on on food I'm not eating, and then also um, I'd come into these hiker places and there are these big box, these hiker boxes full of food, and I was like, and it was, it seemed like it was going to waste, and so um, and then finally the last part too was midway through my uh, PCT I had lost a lot of weight, um, I lost like I want to say thirty five pounds. And so, so, and I was getting weak, I could feel it. And so um, I had to, I was like, well, I got to start eating the stuff I want to eat. You know, I, I, I got to start bringing food from town, uh, like pizza, Subway sandwiches. And I just, so I had to do all these things and it just kept on changing through the hike. So I, I kind of, I, I just had to adapt. So that's why resupplying from the trail worked for me. And um, some of the pros on it um, is that, uh, yeah, you save money because you're going, you go to that hiker box first, you grab what food you can, and then you go to the grocery store and supplement it. So you save some money that way. Plus, um, you know, you start to learn yourself better. So, um, you know, you know how many days it's going to take you from, from town to town. And, and so you're not, sending a box to yourself with five days of food when you only need three um so that's uh that there's a lot of cost savings there uh it's adaptable if you see something you like from someone else you can go get it at the next town um and then the other thing too is you're not paying for uh, for shipping fees which i i feel like every time you get one of those uh, medium-sized boxes that's like 18 dollars of non-edible uh, money you're putting into that box and so I rather spend that money on food and um, so it's it, but I, I mean it doesn't work every time you got to know this this the trail the sections of trail where you're gonna you you actually need to send some resupply boxes from uh, some of the cons of my style um, you gotta it's a skill that you have to learn and it's not something that happens overnight you you just gotta walk into that grocery store spend time in there like learning where everything is and trying to figure out what's you know high calorie dense and um you know maybe doesn't waste so much what tastes good you're gonna have you're gonna have it's like uh you'll have some failures you'll have some successes but eventually you'll get it and by like the fifth time you're in that grocery store you're going to be like some cyber cyborg. You're going to have this like laser focus and you're just going to see that thing from across the store and you'll be like, that's it. That's what I need. And, and, it, and it'll be really fast and easy. So, um, yeah, that's, but, but yeah, that's, that's one of the problems. Um, the other thing with my style is that it could keep you in town longer because like you might even have to take a zero in town and a zero that that's like you're not hiking any miles that day so a big a big zero miles and so you might have to take an extra zero just to prep um your food and especially if you gotta do resupply boxes you, yeah so so it takes some extra time for sure thanks theo you and trey both mentioned hiker boxes could you just explain it for those in the audience who might not be familiar with a hiker box <laughs> 
Yeah, that's a great thing. And what it is, is that all these uh, stops along the way, uh, so many people bring so much extra gear, they bring so much extra food. And of course, you want to lighten your pack as much as possible. So um, they just you just take your extra food, you put it, there's usually some cardboard box somewhere. And um, it's either at the community center, at the motels, or some hiker-friendly place, some trail angel. And yeah, people just leave anything they don't want. And uh, it's it's free for you to take whatever you need. Uh, and as in, on the PCT, in the first like 300 miles, those things are just full. Like, there's like mountains of food. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and then of course, other places, there's there's just a few things. And, um, but you never know until you get there. And of course you don't want to take all the food. Yeah. Briefly in my experience with hiker boxes, uh, is I don't have much because, um, I think if you're following a strict diet, oftentimes the foods that are getting dumped, um, for whatever reason, uh, tend to always be glutinous. Um, a lot of pop tarts you know, is a big one in there. Uh, lots of ramen. That's a big one. Things that, um, people just seem to get sick of easily. Um, also you may find mystery bags. They're unlabeled um, and they are to be consumed at your own risk. And for me, I did <laughs> never take that risk. <laughs> but, yeah, that's uh, true. Sometimes a mystery bag is, is this a bag of oatmeal or a bag of detergent? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so for the next section, we'll be talking about tips for resupplying in town. And when I talk about resupplying in town, I'm also talking about feeding yourself nutritionally from restaurants, um, whether it's the pizza and subway that Theo's talking about or whatever Trey is able to find locally, which I'm very curious to hear about. Um, and I'm also very curious about if there are certain trails or states along a trail or national parks or other um, concessionaires that tend to be a little bit better um, for the sort of food you want. My thing as soon as I get into town is a huge bowl of cut up fruit. <laughs> that is the one thing I immediately go to the grocery store when I can, if there is a grocery store, um, because I crave something cold, something fresh. That's the number one thing I get. And then I'll go get the pizza and a beer afterwards <laughs> and hang out with people. Um, but again, I'm very particular about what I eat. So I don't buy a lot of extra food when I'm in town because I've already, um, sent my box and I might do a little toiletries kind of shopping and that kind of thing. Um, but going back to how I know how I feel when I eat is when I did the AT is I got caught up when they being social with everybody and eating in town a lot and not eating my own food. And I felt terrible because it wasn't how I normally eat. So it was a lot more processed food, a lot more sugary things that aren't as high in protein and those kind of things. So, and then I ended up carrying all that extra food, like Theo was saying, cause I wasn't eating it. So then I would dump all that in the hiker box and everybody else was loving my food because I wasn't eating it. It was this homemade food. Um, but I found on the AT, it's definitely easier to resupply because you're close to town. But then I felt worse because it wasn't the food that I normally eat. Um, the Colorado Trail was pretty easy resupplying along there. So having good restaurants and that kind of thing. And the PCT, as everybody else probably say, it's definitely more remote. So your ability to get good food that you want is a little bit more um, limited based on some of the towns. Thank you, Erin. Sounds like I need to hike behind you. Don't think so. <laughs> Actually, that's what people, the, I'll get Instagram messages saying, where's your latest hiker boxes to <laughs> unload? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because yeah. they'll follow behind me and come and get the, whatever I'm not eating, I'll get it out of the hiker box. That's great. Well, Trey, I bet your tips for resupplying in Trail Town are a little bit different. Do you yes. like to talk about some of your experiences? Yeah, they're a little different. Um, I'll probably focus on town food as opposed to getting, um, you know, an actual resupply. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I do if, uh, a day or two before I get to town is when I find that I have cell service, um, you know, a five-star campsite is not complete without a little cell service on a through hike. And uh, I'll use an app called Find Me Gluten-Free. Um, this is not just for celiacs. Um, it One perk of the app is that it lists if they are gluten sensitive um, or they have celiac disease, just so you can, you know, a report that someone gives about a restaurant on this app may not be relevant to me if they don't have the same condition um, and the same parameters they have to eat within. Um, but oftentimes they'll just leave uh, reviews of restaurants for community members, uh, just sort of saying they didn't have anything for me. They did. Um, the, the, the servers didn't know what celiac disease was. They did. Um, I will say in these trail towns, usually the answer is they don't know what it is. Um, 
And if there's not a lot of options, the next thing I'll look for is um, I'll get on Google Maps and look for a Thai restaurant. Um, in my experiences, Thai restaurants are the easiest to navigate without any uh, information from others, just because they tend to be a more rice-based as opposed to um, wheat-heavy um, items. Um, and it also just send, seems to be easier for them to avoid cross-contamination, um, especially if you're going for things like curry um, or items that don't share like a shared cooking service, like a grill, for instance. You know, if you go to the common like bar and grill or pizza, like a pizza oven, they may have gluten-free pizza, but I can't eat there because they cook it in the same oven, for example. I don't go to the bar and grill and just not get bread because they're going to cook my patty the same place they touch the bread, right? Um, so a lot of things to consider. Um, and also when I go into town, I sort of have to do a little self-talk um, and say, Trey, I know you're really hungry right now and you really want hot food, um, you know, which maybe I should carry a stove. I don't carry one. Um, maybe I wouldn't have these urges as intensely as they are when I get to town um, for hot food. But I, I, I kind of sort of have to walk myself back from taking unnecessary risks. Um, I have gotten sick several times on trail, and uh, I think at this point I've, I've learned my lesson. Um, but what I'll do as an alternative, if I don't think I can eat at a restaurant, is um, I'll look for a larger grocery store that might do rotisserie chicken. Um, that's a, I've had good experiences there of not getting sick from those. Um, also, if I'm getting a room, like a hotel, I'll make sure that I get one with a microwave so I can buy frozen foods to make, like pre-made mashed potatoes, pre-made broccoli and cheese, um, anything um, that the grocery store might have that I can cook essentially in a, in a room. Um, and for those who don't have dietary restrictions, I think that's also a way to save a little bit of money. Um, instead of going out two or three times over the course of a zero, just go buy groceries that you can cook in a microwave or, um, you know, fresh foods that you can sort of just prepare um, out on a table, you know, very delicious salads and that sort of thing. Um, if I'm trying to be very quick in town and I can't eat at a restaurant, I'll go get like um, a pack of deli meat um, or cured meats like salami, um, pepperonis, that sort of thing. And then I'll get a bag salad and then I'll just mix those up. So I get a little bit of vegetable and I get a little bit of animal protein, which I tend to crave on trail, especially in the mornings. Um, but I will say one thing I can sort of catch myself saying in grocery stores is vegetables, 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 um, get fresh food. Like no matter what you eat on trail, um, whether it's more nutrition focused, maybe like what Aaron carries, or it's more process focus for speed and efficiency, um, or just not wanting to prep a lot of different sort of prepackaged foods, um, you're, you're going to need nutrients in town that you cannot get. Um, I, I, to an extent on, on trail. Um, we'll check my notes here just to make sure I didn't leave anything else for you guys. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. As far as like difficult and easy um, trails or states, um, the most difficult state that I dealt with is New Mexico, for sure, <laughs> on the Continental Divide Trail. Um, so I did not spend much time in town there at all. Um, I often would avoid staying at a hotel, even if I kind of wanted one, just because there was not a lot of food access. Um, and the easiest state was the one before that on the CDT, uh, would be Colorado. There just seemed to be, everyone seemed to know what celiac disease was. There was gluten-free options everywhere. I was eating gluten-free pancakes, um, gluten-free pastries. Um, people were just like, we'll take care of you. So yeah, it's not all bad. <laughs> Thank you, Trey. And actually, one one story I remember you telling me that really surprised me was that you had a, a positive interaction looking for a gluten-free food in Glacier National Park. Yes, Glacier. Um, I was able to get hot food at a campground. Uh, they had like a full restaurant there. And uh, I've uh, before I'd hiked the CDT, uh, people would say how hard it is to start in Glacier. Um, to be honest, I'll probably never start a trail that isn't a desert trail in the desert again, just because I find um, starting in the heat to be quite difficult at the beginning. Um, and yes, Glacier National Park does have a lot of vert uh, up and down, um, but <laughs> it seems like every couple of nights for the five to seven days that you're in there, um, you get to stay at campgrounds with amenities. And I was able to eat a cheeseburger and um, French fries uh, as a celiac. So um, 
yeah, sometimes you get surprised. That's great. Now, Theo, for a completely different experience in Trail Town. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, first off, every trail is different and every trail has different requirements. Like the PCT is well established with the resupplies and, and you're sending those uh, those first class uh, boxes here and there um, where you're getting your food from the towns that seem to really like to take care of hikers. I mean, and Julian, the sheriff, might pick you up and take you into town it's that nice on but then on the jmt you you gotta put your food in this kind of this uh plastic bucket with a lid and and they have all these requirements on how to label them and it costs money uh they they charge a fee for that uh on the tahoe rim trail i just drove around the lake and half a day i dropped off all my resupply here and there um on the wind river high route I had to get a horse uh, resupply, so there was a there was a ranch, and uh, had to pay him a lot of money to bring my my food out to me. Uh, but it was it was worth it for what we were trying to do. Um, so yeah, you kind of got to know the different sections of the trail and 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 how to resupply in those areas. And and like for instance, uh, Lake Tahoe, I uh, I'd spend a couple extra days getting ready for the Northern California section sending all my boxes up to those places because that was the only way. Um, hey, one great thing about uh, coming into town and, and what's really interesting is when you have a trail family, they, they can help you kind of absorb um, the cost of food, especially, you know, like you you buy a package of food and there's like, there's like 10 bars in there, but you only need five of them. So you can you can split them up with your trail family and that helps save costs. And sometimes one of your trail family, they're they're resupplying from their box, but they put too much food in there, and they'll they'll give it to you. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there's some dynamics with your trail family uh, that can help you along the way. Can you um, define trail family for those who are unfamiliar yeah. with it? <laughs> so a lot of people they uh, they start by themselves, and it's and it's fine. And eventually, as you're walking you'll find people that kind of have the same hiking style as you. They like to stop at the same places and you kind of probably have the same sense of humor and, uh, and you just start to bond and pretty soon you might have a group of maybe like five. Uh, I, I don't know if I ever saw any group bigger than like eight, but um, uh, it's really good. It's good for like safety uh, when you're hitchhiking, you know, it's nice to be in a few numbers. Um, it's good for sharing information. Uh, I think the best part of it is just that they make you laugh along the way. They 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 really break that boredom of the trail. Um, and uh, in the Sierras, you definitely want a trail family to do those uh, river crossings because there's there's some techniques that require a group. Um, and they they sometimes uh, you you start off with one group and it might evolve and and then you might end up with another group and. Uh, and then you might just, and it's just, it's just however you want to do it. There's no rules to it. It's just, it just naturally evolves. It's, it's really cool. Um, there, I, now I got to give you one warning about the trail towns and I'm going to share this right here for you. Trail towns are dangerous. They're very dangerous. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, there's this, it's the $10 an hour rule and Basically, when you're in town, for every hour that you're there, you're going to spend at least $10. And with inflation today, it could be even $15 an hour. So, I mean, you're going to spend money on restaurants, eating a lot of food, getting your resupply, repairing your, your gear or getting new gear. Um, you're going to see your fellow hikers that you haven't seen in a while, and you're going to you're gonna want to hang out with them, get more drinks, and and you just find reasons to spend money. It's really like just coming out of your your wallet faster than uh, you know. It's too fast. So uh, yeah, beware of that. The other thing I want to uh, this is just a I just want to share this thing with you. This is a dollar store resupply strategy, and um, I kind of like that. I kind of like the dollar store because. Um, you know, you end up buying a lot of packaged uh, food, but uh, they sell it for less. And um, and in order to do that, they have smaller portion sizes. So, it, but it actually works out really well for um, 
the number of days you're out there on the trail. And so here on the, here's the list of trail towns on the right side. And the ones that are highlighted in uh, green um, are the towns that actually have these dollar stores. And uh, I mean, of course I try and go to the local stores, but um, it's been pretty convenient. And in fact, this just came out in the New York Times and you can see the amount of dollar stores and you can see that this one kind of lines the Dollar Tree, kind of lines the PCT and look at, look at the Appalachian Trail. I mean, I haven't done that, but who knows? But and they just, they just seem to be popping up more and more. Uh, but that's just that's just one strategy. And uh, and they and some are uh, some are getting fresher food in there. So it's it's becoming a, an option to consider for sure. Uh, Let's see. I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, yeah. Oh, one great thing you got to know: some some restaurants have a secret hiker menu, and um, <laughs> it's the best. And uh, you you basically uh, there's the menu, and and then there's the secret hiker menu. One of the best ones is in Cascade Locks. Uh, they got the pizza burger. So the buns are pizza slices, and there's a burger. And uh, it is, and you'll eat it all because you are so hungry. And uh, <laughs> so, so check that out. When you you might have the far out app, and uh, sometimes they'll have those tips in there. Um, yep. Thank you, Theo. That indeed was very different than the other speakers. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, um, I think Naomi, uh, founder of Treeline Review, will take the Q and A. Um, lead the Q&A, and I know some of you have had some questions in the chat. And then right after that, we'll just hear last parting words from our speakers, and I'll give a little bit of um, what to expect after this as far as follow-up and when the video recording will be available and other notes and resources we'll have available. So, Naomi, do you want to take it away? Yeah, so um, one of the questions we have is about um, getting your boxes back from the post office if you don't pick them up. And... Um, I, I've never had this experience. I don't know if any of you have, but um, if you call them, will the post office send your box back, back to you if you don't pick it up? I think it might depend on the post office, but do any of you, have any of you experienced that? I have a special case for this, actually. Um, I got very sick on my first attempt at a through hike on the John Muir Trail and had to leave. And I was able to get my uh, bear can that I mailed from your Muir, Muir Trail Ranch, which is probably the most remote uh, reasonable eye location on the North American trails that I know of. Uh, so if you have enough patience, you can get it back. Uh, it usually requires a phone call. And uh, if it was by U.S. mail, at least to my uh, to my knowledge, it is at no cost. Right. Yeah. And, and my experience has been because I have the resupply services. My experience has been they'll ship it back to your home um, without being present um, because they just assume and make sure you put your return address on the box um, because they will ship it back to you because they know it came from that sender. Um, otherwise, the bouncing gets a little bit more challenging because they do want you to be present. But sending it back home and I've gotten boxes 30 to 60 days later. <laughs> So it sometimes does take a little while. How about this? How do you portion out from the grocery store? Example, a whole jar of peanut butter. I mean, I know um, Bliss talked about that a little bit about um, sharing with your trail family, but uh, any other tips around that? I would say don't count out the possibility that you will want the entire jar of, the peanut, of peanut butter. <laughs> totally fair. <laughs> Um, yeah, other, otherwise, uh, that, that, that's sort of a joke, not really, because any any hike over five days that I go on, I carry a full jar of peanut butter. I find that it's a great fat supplement. Um, if I maybe um, undershot my calories for their respective hike, for whatever reason, altitude or uh, eat things that make me eat less or more. Um, but yeah, I think uh, the other panelists might have a little bit more information about repackaging in uh, on the go. <laughs> Yeah, mine, um, I uh, I like freezer bag cooking, and that's where you boil your water in your stove, and then you dump it into the freezer bag with your food in there. Um, yeah, there, foodie showing. <laughs> um, so that's, so I definitely have to portion it out. Uh, it, it, it really is bad when you have too much food and you don't know what to do with it, and, and you're out there and you, you got to bury it or something, but, um, <clears throat> or you got to eat it, but, um, yeah, so, yeah, I portion it ahead of time when I can, 
Um, but most of the time I like to, you know, you start to find the foods that you can eat uh, that are that are that single size, or maybe you divide it between two Ziploc bags, um, freezer bags when you're out there. Um, question about hiker boxes. How do you know where there are hiker boxes ahead of time? Um, my guess is far out is probably the one place you could look. I don't I don't know of a um actual list of hiker boxes. Has have any of you seen that? Yeah, definitely in the comments on uh, on um far out. Well, yeah. definitely there, there's always little hints uh especially if you're in the back of the bubble middle of the bubble where the bubble is um the group of hikers and um it, it kind of varies by your start date on the trail but if you're um but usually if there's if there's people ahead of you they'll tell you on that app where the food is where the water is how the service is there, there's so much info they they give on the app um, yeah Mm -hmm. But then I think, I think you'll just develop that sense in your head. You'll, 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 you'll develop that sense and you'll know where that hiker box is after a few stops and towns. Yeah. And what I'm finding this season is that some people that have always had hiker boxes aren't having them anymore. So it even can change from year to year. So if you can get the most recent far out information, that's probably the best bet versus reading blogs and relying on what last year's information was, because it could be very different this year. A uh, question for you, Trey, uh, fellow celiac who has trouble with soy sauce at Thai restaurants. Do you have that issue as well? Um, I find you want to ask for tamari, um, which is essentially soy sauce without wheat, uh, to my understanding. Um, <clears throat> I feel like most Thai restaurants, at least largely in my experience offer tamari whatever you can do to sort of see it yourself um it's definitely um a positive of staying safe uh, is the term that i use um and healthy um, but yeah tamari if you haven't had it um it's a perfectly tasty alternative to soy sauce okay more about post office if you send boxes to another location other than the post office do you lose the bouncing option and yes, I believe you yes. do. You take it away from the counter in the post office, you've taken delivery and that's it. Right. And then other places too, if you send it to like Grumpy Bears in Katie Meadow South or the Candy Meadow, the general store, some of those have the ability to mail them forward for you um, from there, but you do have to pay the fee. So you're not going to be able to bounce it forward for free like you would at a post office if you were to pick it up there. How much money do you spend on average for food on a through hike? <laughs> Everyone thinks their tent, their DCF tent, is probably their most expensive thing, but it's actually with food. I think. I mean, you're, I think on a five month trip, uh, it's it has to be like at least thousands, like fifteen hundred. I mean, I spent six thousand on my through hike uh, of the PCTs, and a good chunk of that was the food. Um, yeah, it, it it costs money. It's it's the most it's the most challenging and the most costly part. And I just did a quick calculation on my phone based on all of our meals are roughly around $3 or so to make the expensive ones. Um, so for me to have three of my meals per day plus snacks is about $25 a day. So for, I'm a slow hiker, so it takes me five months if I'm going to do. So that's $3,600 just in food is what I would probably typically spend making all my own and buying all my own. Um, I believe I uh, estimated about fourteen dollars per day in two thousand eighteen, um, but that's for before adding a few supplemental things, uh, which usually consisted of bananas, avocados, um, cured meats. Um, so probably closer to sixteen plus per day. Um, I did not calculate for the trails after that, but I would say it only got more expensive. Um, so maybe fifteen to twenty dollars per day, depending on how much you eat, um, what type of foods you're eating. Um, my experience oh i love i love peanut butter and ramen it's just so good uh, <laughs> that's that's one of my favorites you know even if you have a bad bar if you just dip it in peanut butter it just tastes way better and if you get sick of your bars just do that or sprinkle it with salt there's another pro tip <laughs> nice nice one uh, of my big oh go ahead sorry oh no you go booty um, well, like I was saying for my Colorado trail trip, and I've learned this since, I really rely heavily on my meal replacement drinks because I eat five to 6,000 calories easily. And I'm so sick of chewing. I'm just tired of eating <laughs> so because it's so much food that I'd rather just, and actually I've got one here. Um, 
just like the freezer bag, put water in it, zip it up, shake, and down the hatch. I don't even stop. I'm an ultralight hiker too. I don't like to stop for very long. Um, so I keep them in my hip belt pocket and I just add water and they're easily 600 calories and I keep on moving. Um, so that's one of the things that I really rely on when I'm out there. Do you make those yourself? Those, those yeah, meals? They're just, I was going to say, you can do it at the grocery store. They're just dry ingredients. Um, one of my favorite recipes you could do it in town is, and everybody uses carnation breakfast essentials peanut butter powder, PB fit, and some whole milk powder. Um, and like you were talking about, just dump it in like a big gallon baggie and you could have five days worth of the shake all in one and maybe just keep a couple smaller baggies if you wanted to portion it out kind of thing. But I'm also, I'm lazy. I don't like to do dishes. So that's another reason why I freezer bag cook <laughs> because everything's in there and I don't have to do any dishes. Um, I really like, the, I, I continue to eat the same food as I always have, and I don't like them any less, especially the more meal oriented things that are not on the move snacks. Um, Trader Joe's has an excellent hearty gluten-free granola. Um, and for all of my, or both of my really long hikes, um, I called a Trader Joe's in advance and essentially put an order in. They technically don't accept customer orders, but it was kind of like, hey, I'm going to need this many bags, which is like 40 bags. Um, and uh, can you make sure that you have that amount available and just maybe set them to the side? And they're like, yeah, no problem. So I walked into the Trader Joe's and I came out with half of a buggy or I'm from the South, we call them buggies, <laughs> um, grocery carts um, full of granola. Um, and then I like to add um, an ounce or two of Neato powdered milk. And I just have that as essentially a, a 600 calorie cereal when I wake up. Um, I also like the classic hiker tuna packet, which I'll add olive oil to. Um, and I like to have it with cheese and maybe some like salt and vinegar chips. Um, and then the evenings, I always do dried mashed potatoes with nutritional yeast, uh, dehydrated peppers, some added oil. Um, and then I like for dessert, um, I think think brand uh, chocolate brownie protein bar smeared fully in peanut butter. Um, I look forward to those that list of food every single day. Never get tired of it. Find what you like. Find what works. Um, but for gluten free, CDX, safe stuff, those are the foods that I look forward to eating um, pretty much every time I go backpacking. Yeah, and I just want to add on to um, one of my favorites is doing like a a pesto pasta. So I take the angel hair pasta. I take a, a packet of the pesto dried pesto sauce, and then I get really creative I, I put like the pine nuts on it i'll put the the salad dress the salad toppings like the fried onion the fried garlic um and maybe some soy sauce or something i'll i'll just get it all souped up make it like extra special and it tastes really good and um you know what's really cool is um going to the asian mart they got some really good stuff there um and it's like it's like a third of the cost or, or it's like it's like 30 percent cheaper than than other places um and uh like like those coffee packages like you go to rei and you get like six for like 15 bucks rip off it's like i like i like going to trader joe's and getting the um the 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 instant coffee and and like if you find a cold spring on the trail and you 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 pour that coffee in there and you shake it up you get like a frappe um and you know those things kind of like i said at the beginning like it, like I'm, I'm looking for that mental health kind of happiness thing in my food. Like, um, when talking to my wife, it's, it's one of my, my love languages is, is food. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's, um, that, yeah, you need those little boosts and food that, that, that bring your attitude up. One thing I would just add is, uh, if you're someone who likes to whittle down your gear to taking, you know, a, you know, the least amount you can always reserve a, reserve a space um, for food as your luxury item. Like sometimes you just got to forget about the caloric, caloric density and just pack stuff that tastes good and you want to eat. Um, <laughs> I don't particularly look for, I don't go to the extremes of looking for rice cakes. Like I'm not going to get too much out of that for how big they are. Um, but I have no problem carrying out a few whole fruits, like a heavy avocado, or like I said, a few bananas, like or whatever it might be that really tastes good to you. Like you can eat that stuff on the first day, second day of a long carry. Like you'll be glad that you got it <laughs> for sure. Great, great information. Y'all have such different perspectives, but yet, you know, I, I feel like we could keep talking about this for a whole nother hour, honestly. And lastly, um, 
I want to give the panelists a, a very short time to give their last parting words. Erin. So as you could tell, I'm passionate about backpacking nutrition. <laughs> it's what I do for a living. So please feel free to reach out to me if you do have questions, if you're struggling, if you're hitting the wall, you're not recovering, all those kind of things, please reach out. Um, and my website's backcountryfoodie.com. There's all kinds of resources there. So I'm here to help. I love it. <laughs> so someone in the chat said they had celiac. And if there are anyone, is there anyone else in the chat that has celiac? Um, definitely reach out to me for particular questions. I can't promise that it's a fast response, but I will give you... Um, the information that I have. I'm happy to share spreadsheets of information um, that I have saved from prior through hikes. Um, if you have, if you're doing maybe the Pacific Crest Trail or the uh, Continental Divide Trail in particular, I can do my best to be um, supportive in that. Um, I was fortunate enough to have some guidance from uh, Sean Forey, if anyone's heard of him, uh, who also has celiac disease um, and also um, give me a, some inspiration that I could go do these hikes, um, even with a severe dietary restriction, because um, for those who don't know, that's one of the more hiked people probably on earth. Um, and not just that, this person is doing hikes that are not, uh, that are off the beaten path, that are that don't have a lot of information. So with the right planning um, and expectations, like you can do these hikes. So um, yeah, we'll find a way uh, for Liz to connect us, or you can find me on Instagram. Um, if you use Instagram uh, at Trey Tamari, um, which uh, is spelled out in the, the um, on the event page. I'm Bliss. Don't let this resupply stop you from hiking. It, you'll get it. It's on the job training. Um, you know, you'll you'll just learn it. It just happens. I mean, you're you're gonna want to eat. Uh, you're gonna have successes and failures on the trail, and that's what makes this adventure so great. One of the best parts about being on the trail is that I think you'll find your true and authentic self out there and the best version of yourself. And it's just the, it's the most wonderful thing, uh, especially in this world of so much technology and stuff, just to clear your mind and, and, and find who you truly are out there. It's it's really amazing. So, so keep it up. And I'm so thankful you, you came to this event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Theo. I couldn't say it better myself. Well, thank you everyone for joining and we look forward to seeing you at the next Treeline Review online event and hopefully we will see you all on the trail as well.